Oh no, God! No, God, please, no! No! Well, it's been a decade since The Flash was announced, and the cinematic landscape has shifted dramatically since then. The film has endured a long, fiery journey through production hell, replete with a carousel of directors, countless script revisions, rescheduled release dates, and a total production and marketing budget that ballooned well past the $400 million mark. This all before James Gunn dropped a bombshell that the entire current DC canon is essentially irrelevant as they're hitting the reset button. With the film suffering from one of the worst opening weekends for a superhero film, a horrific 81% drop in box office receipts in its second week, making it the worst performing superhero film since Steel and Morbius. It appears as though The Flash is in trouble. So does the film justify the seemingly endless wait? Does it live up to some of the hyperbolic praise labeling it the greatest superhero movie of all time? Or does the very loose adaptation of the Flashpoint storyline from the comics simply use nostalgia as a smokescreen to obscure its many shortcomings? Allow me to break the ice. Before we dive into the story, its characters, and the many problems with the movie, including the woeful CGI, which, per the director, Andy Muschietti, was a conscious choice, let's unpack the chaotic production process that got us here. Bruce, I could fix things. You could also destroy everything. This can't be happening. The Flash has had such a dumpster fire of a production history that it would give Apocalypse Now a run for its money. They've been toying with the idea of a Flash film since the 80s, and by 2014, they'd nailed down Ezra Miller for the title role, aiming for a 2018 release. Well, here we are in 2023, and that timeline's as warped as a DC continuity. First off, we've got more directors for this project than episodes of Game of Thrones, from Phil Lord and Christopher Miller, Seth Graham Smith, Rick Famuyiwa, who all left due to creative differences. By 2017, Warner were getting desperate with Robert Zemeckis, Sam Raimi, and Jordan Peele, all passing on the offer to direct, with the film laboring in production hell, in 2018, John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein were hired to helm The Flash, but they also left due to disagreements between the duo, Warner Brothers, and Ezra Miller over the direction. After a game of directorial hot potato, Andy Muschietti decided he could handle the heat. He directed both parts of the It adaptations, so I guess he was used to dealing with clowns, but unlike the SS Georgie, The Flash doesn't rise or float too. It sinks. Apparently, around 45 different writers have had a go at the script, including Ezra Miller. That's a lot of creative minds, all with creative differences and varying degrees of competency and mental stability. And it shows in the clunky plotting, watered-down character work and contrivances littered throughout. Now, in the midst of all this chaos, there's been one constant, Ezra Miller, who's been caught up in some rather unsavory incidents, with multiple arrests and charges of assault, trespassing, theft and harassment. Despite all of this, Warner Brothers decided to press ahead because they'd already poured over $400 million into the film. With the release date being pushed back several times, multiple reshoots to facilitate needless cameos, in this roller coaster of a production, the only real stable thing has been instability. Thanks to the grand reshuffle of the DC Universe now headed by James Gunn and Peter Safran, Warner's got a handy eject button if and more likely when they decide to boot Miller out of the franchise. The result? This year's DC lineup is like a football team that's already faced relegation playing out the rest of the season just for the hell of it. And after a stint in development hell, The Flash arrived right on time for utter irrelevancy. You wanna get nuts? Let's get nuts. We kick things off in the bustling metropolis of Central City, where our speedster, Ezra Miller's Barry Allen, decides to pit stop for a sandwich before clocking in for the day. No sooner does he place his order when he gets a phone call from Jeremy Irons Alfred. The old chap's got a mission that requires Barry's unique ability, and Barry doesn't miss a beat, slipping into his suit and bolting off to stop a bloody hospital from tumbling into a giant sinkhole. Then the maternity ward starts raining babies, a nurse, and even a dog from the window. With Barry running on fumes, he raids a vending machine, stuffing his face with snacks until he's got enough juice to save the day. The notion that there's a cap on his abilities, like a battery that needs to be recharged, forcing him to continually eat, is great. We'd expect this to be a setup for a major payoff at the end. Perhaps Barry will be in a position where he doesn't have enough energy to save someone. Right? Wrong. For some reason, this is all forgotten later in the film, and there's no payoff. Explaining the main character has limitations and then ignoring said restrictions for the rest of the film seems needlessly self-contradictory, but here we are. It's here it became obvious that, with its plentiful use of CGI, the movie was bearing more resemblance to an animated film than a live-action one. 
Flash tries to rescue numerous infants from the crumbling hospital wing, who find themselves in varying degrees of perilous predicaments. But what makes this scene weird is their ghoulish rendering. Their uncanny valley aesthetics are far removed from resembling real babies, and while it's understood that the use of real infants was not an option, the CGI depiction was glaringly artificial. The scene could have been bypassed by an alternative narrative decision, such as having the babies already evacuated from the hospital, with Flash focusing on averting falling debris, so I'm not sure why they even bothered. Still, at the same time, over in Gotham, Ben Affleck's Batman is having a grand old time chasing the terrorists responsible for the hospital attack, who've got their hands on a lethal virus. I love this sequence and think that Ben Affleck Batman is brilliant, but had a few questions, like why is the shield Batman puts up when he's getting shot at not cover his face? Seems like a design flaw. Nonetheless, a thrilling bat cycle chase ensues, ending with Batman handing out a righteous thrashing before facing off with the head honcho. He sends the villain's vehicle careening off a bridge, only for Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman to use her lasso to reel them back in. Three cameos down, 50 to go. Barry then whizzes over to work at the research center, where his colleagues Patty Spivett and Albert Desmond and even his boss antagonize him about being late. Henry Allen, recast from Billy Crudup to Ron Livingston, has essentially been behind bars for two decades, accused of killing his wife Nora. Barry, of course, holds fast to his belief in his father's innocence. Enter Iris West, his crush and a reporter that recognizes Barry from their college days. While Barry does insist on not wanting to go on the record, feigning friendship, West tries to goad him into giving her a scoop on the case. Not sure why Barry likes her or why the scene was wooden, but what I am sure of is that the chemistry between Clemens and Miller is non-existent. Dissecting security footage from a shop where Henry was supposedly at when Nora met her gruesome end, Barry and his father discuss the case. Unfortunately, the bloke's face is conveniently as visible as a polar bear in a snowstorm, making Barry fear the footage won't hold up in court. Most shops have multiple cameras at the entrance, but wanting to save money, this one apparently only bought one and placed it over the canned tomatoes, their most valuable items of course. Not one to sit idle, Barry dons his suit and zooms over to their old family home. This triggers a flashback where we see young Barry, his dad off to nab a can of tomatoes Nora needed for dinner, and then the piercing scream that haunted his nightmares. Coming back to a grisly scene of his mum with a knife in her chest and his dad cradling her lifeless body, Barry cranks up the speed, blazing so fast that he starts seeing the day's events rewind like an old VHS tape. The kicker, he realizes, he's quick enough to travel back in time a full day, despite having done so in the Snyder Cut to literally save the world. Make your own future. He then spills the beans to Batman, suggesting he could rewind all the way back to spare both of their parents from their tragic fates, but Bruce serves up a slice of harsh truth. They've got to endure the trauma to become who they're meant to be. Naturally, ignoring his advice, Barry strikes up a plan to undo Nora's death by traveling back in time. Considering Nora sent his father to the shops to get the tomatoes she forgot to buy earlier, Barry reasons that all he has to do is sneak the tomatoes into Nora's shopping cart. That way, she never forgets them, Henry never leaves, and Nora doesn't bite the dust. Easy enough, but there's a catch. While he saves his mother and witnesses her being there for his 18th year, another speedster pops out of nowhere and knocks Barry clean out of the speed force, tossing him back in front of his old childhood home in Norton at past. Unable to help himself, instead of simply traveling back to the future to see what effect this now had, Barry steps into his old home and speaks to his parents, who were a bit confused to see him looking slightly different, but glad to see him nonetheless. Then who should arrive but a fresh-faced 18-year-old Barry, who will call Barry 2 for the sake of clarity, but not charity, for nothing can reduce the blow of having two Ezra Millers on screen. Barry intercepts his younger self and swiftly takes him up to his room, laying down the bare bones about his super speed and the twisted timeline he's jumped from. You are not you, you are me. No shit. Barry 2 then casually drops it at September 29th, the very day Barry originally got zapped into the speedster he is. But with this version of him not working at the research center, the epicenter of the freak accident that gave future Barry his pals, he forces Barry to, to go along with a crazy plan. Following a bout of deja vu, both Barrys head off to recreate the events. But with Barry to having a minor meltdown, Barry positions himself right in the path of the bolt, causing it to hit them both. As the guards swarm in, they run out of there, only for Barry to realize he's lost his phasing and super speed abilities. While Barry 2 starts indulging in some reckless power-infused fun, until older Barry reigns him in. The loss of Barry's abilities only escalates the drama, as he attempts to guide his alternate self into using the newfound powers for good. 
However, the next day, just as Barry hands Barry to his very own suit, they discover a throng of people gawking at a news report about General Zod and his Kryptonian team rocking up on Earth. Barry surmises they're hunting for Superman, and the pair set out to find the rest of the Justice League. But the pickings are slim. Victor Stone hasn't morphed into Cyborg, Thomas Curry, played by Tamura Morrison, didn't marry Atlanta or Sire Arthur, and Wonder Woman's completely off the radar. Unfortunately, this is a world without metahumans. Not only that, but there's also other slight differences in this world that initially throw Barry off. So, Barry traveling back and altering the past has essentially created a convergence, where multiple realities are beginning to fuse and collide. He's the reason Zod and his forces have basically landed here. Which begs the question, how was the Flash able to save the Justice League and the world from Annihilation in the Snyder Cut by going back in time with no repercussions? More than that, has he just forgotten that he used it? Or is that now not canon, like this film when James Gunn's new slate comes in? Regardless, everyone agrees on one thing though, Batman does exist. He has to because his box office performances are legendary, and so both Barry and Barry 2 set off in search of the Cape Crusader. The two rock up at Wayne Manor, hoping to find Bruce, and stumble upon an older, scruffy version of Bruce played by Michael Keaton, who's living out a solitary existence in the wake of Alfred's death. Fighting them in the kitchen in a hilarious sequence for breaking into his home, Bruce from Batman 89 is bitter as a cup of black coffee, and essentially hung up his cape since Gotham City turned into a peaceful paradise as a result of his work. He succeeded in his ultimate goal, but has not been able to move on from that. When Barry spills the beans about the alternate future and his time antics, Bruce drops a bombshell. Barry's time travel shenanigans have ripped open other timelines in the multiverse. He also flatly refuses to assist in locating Superman, prompting the Barrys to sneak into the Batcave and start digging around on Bruce's high-tech computers. Even with a civilian attire, explaining the complexities of time travel via lazy pastor analogies, Keaton's charisma is undeniably potent. He owns the screen with a mere lift of his eyebrows, which carry the weight of his past and the lingering threat beneath his calm demeanor. Eventually, like us, Barry's patience wears thin, dealing with his younger self's frivility and juvenile antics, but he can't muster up the courage to admit why he ventured back in time to start with. After a heartfelt chat with Bruce, he finally convinces the retired Batman to don the Batsuit one more time. Using a secret connection to NASA from the Batcave, Bruce then points them to a Kryptonian captive held in a Siberian facility. The initial era of the movie feels as though it's stuck in molasses. If you found one Ezra Miller exasperating, brace yourself for double trouble. The pair are relentlessly grating, and the awkward injection of Marvel-style lowbrow humor completely misfires. This tonal dissonance undermines the otherwise grave narrative that grapples with yet another multiverse crisis. The uneven tonal balance can be traced back to the screenplay itself, which flounders in its inconsistent mood, clunky plodding, and throwaway dialogue. The film harbors moments of genuine sentiment and seriousness, only to undercut them with a barrage of crude jerks and physical gags aimed to inject levity at the cost of either character, logic, or tension. Regardless, the unconventional trio board the Batwing, flying their way to Siberia before slipping into the base. What they discover is not Kal-El, but a young Kryptonian woman, Kara Zor-El, brought to life by Sasha Kao. Despite her not being the person they were after, they agree to rescue her nonetheless, completely oblivious as to who she really was. The rescue mission kicks off, but not without a hitch. Barry too takes a bullet to the leg as the mercenaries spot them, forcing Keaton's stunt double to save the day with an explosive diversion. However, once they're out in the cold Siberian air, the mercenaries corner our heroes. Just when things are looking bleak, the sun rays revitalize Kara, who then proceeds to lay a hefty smackdown on the mercenaries before collapsing again to facilitate the plot. When they haul Kara back to Wayne Manor, she reveals her identity as Kal-El's cousin, sent on a mission to protect him after Krypton was wiped out. Upon hearing that Zod has set foot on Earth, she suits up in her Supergirl gear. Barry too attempts to rally her to their cause of world saving, but Kara, having been imprisoned and experimented on, isn't too fond of humanity. Flying off to find Zod, she spots him with his right-hand woman, Feora, just as the Kryptonians begin their conquest of Earth. Now, I love Michael Shannon, one of the greatest character actors around. Despite the problems in that film, his Zod and Man of Steel was menacing, resolute, complex, and still somewhat sympathetic. I exist only to protect Krypton. That is the sole purpose for which I was born. And now, I have no people. But he has nothing to do here but repeat dialogue and replay moments from a better film. The actor even complained about not really knowing what was going on during production, as he was surrounded by a green screen the whole time. 
I'm like, they saw Man of Steel, right? And my manager's like, it's different. I'm like, what is it? It's a multiverse. I'm like, I don't know what that means. So Barry approaches Bruce, requesting help to recreate the lightning storm and reignite his powers. They rig up a contraption for the job, but after the first bolt, Barry too panics and urges Bruce to stop when he sees Barry burnt to a crisp and in pain. Despite this, Barry insists on a rerun, but the contraption fizzes out. Luckily, Kara swoops in, hoists Barry high into the stratosphere, and summons a powerful lightning strike that successfully kickstarts Barry's super speed. There are points within The Flash where the story truly excels. Oh, shit! No, seriously, Keaton's Batman is always a delight to watch, even as he grumbles his way through the fights. Cal, despite limited material, elevates her performance as Supergirl, but the whole thing often feels like a multiverse-themed branding extravaganza. The most disheartening moment has to be Keaton delivering his iconic Let's Get Nuts line with about as much enthusiasm as a man filming a hostage tape. The line clearly doesn't work in this context, and Keaton doesn't seem to be thrilled to be reciting the classic phrase here. It's all just a bit sad. With their powers combined, the heroes resolve to put a stop to Zod by working as a team. And so, as Zod is setting up his world engine to terraform Earth, the two Barrys and Kara rush in to engage the Kryptonians while Batman provided air support in the Batwing. You would think that since it took Zod quite some time to become as powerful as Superman and Man of Steel, that the Kryptonians, who literally just arrived, would be light work for Supergirl and two speedsters who could kill them within minutes. But for some reason, to facilitate plot, they're all ridiculously underpowered here. Kara ultimately faces off with Zod, who drops a bombshell. They were hunting her, not Kal-El, to use her blood and the Codex to rebuild Krypton. When Zod confirms they intercepted Kal-El's pod when he was a baby and killed him, Supergirl unleashes her fury. Despite her efforts, Zod overpowers and kills her by impaling her with a piece of metal before extracting the Codex. She's supposed to be indestructible to everything but kryptonite like Superman, but let's ignore law because the plot requires it. Batman then very uncharacteristically gives up when his jackpot stops working, choosing to commit suicide by smashing his jet into a Kryptonian ship, simultaneously dying in a ball of flames while failing to destroy it because it had a shield. Once again, because the plot needs it to happen, and rattled by the brutal loss of their comrades, both Barrys decide to play the time travel card again, trying to undo the tragedy. But fate cruelly insists on repeating itself, with Kara and Bruce meeting their untimely ends. No matter how hard they try to alter it, every timeline shows them losing the battle, confirming that traveling back in time only alters the future when the writers need it to. As Barry too attempts to time travel again, Barry tries to chase him down. However, they get tangled up in their speed force, the pair are effectively stuck in a brutal time loop of witnessing the death of Bruce and Supergirl, in addition to Earth's destruction, supposedly causing Barry to realize he needs to undo everything by letting his mother die. Things escalate as Barry's frustration reaches a boiling point, and they're suddenly confronted by the culprit of this time warp mess, an older, malevolent Barry II, aka the Dark Flash, who's been incessantly meddling with time. As a consequence, multiple worlds and timelines start to merge, leading to a wild multiverse event featuring different iterations of Flashes, Batmen, Supergirls, and Supermen, including, but not limited to, Teddy Sears' Jay Garrick, Adam West's Batman, Helen Slater's Supergirl, and an eclectic mix of Supermen played by George Reeves, Christopher Reeve, and the cancelled Nicolas Cage Superman Lives. It's just as messy visually as it is narratively, much of it hinging on CGI that feels not just incomplete, but also lends an eerie plasticity to the characters. The subpar VFX begins to seem deliberate, an idea that director Andy Muschietti affirms, which is frankly a more disheartening possibility than if it were simply unintentionally dismal, or the more likely issue of VFX artists not being given enough time to finish their job. But the absolute worst part is that none of these cameos mean anything. The Flash treats its multiverse characters like selectable skins in a video game, with references being their defining characteristics. Oh, you love Jurassic Park! Remember Jeff Goldblum? Oh, I remember Jeff Goldblum. He was fantastic. I love Jeff Goldblum. Mm. Barry Allen doesn't communicate with Nicolas Cage, Adam West, or Christopher Reeve, or any of the other cameos, because they don't affect the film, nor does he learn anything from them. The soulless look in their eyes makes it feel as though they've been resurrected from the dead against their will in the hopes of turning a profit. It actually reminded me of Muschietti's previous film, where Pennywise uses Georgie like a puppet, hoping it would guilt Will into coming closer. Except here, instead of Pennywise, we have the studio, and instead of Georgie, we have projections of beloved icons dangled in front of us. 
Regardless of how I feel about it, Dark Flash strikes, hell-bent on destroying Barry for attempting to undo his mother's rescue. However, Barry too selfishly takes the fatal blow, causing Dark Flash to vanish. As Barry mourns his younger self, he starts to reverse the tide of time. The journey takes him back to the supermarket, right at the pivotal moment he decided to save Nora's life at the cost of merging alternate realities. But while he undoes this, seeing the security camera that failed to record his father's face, he changes its position before returning back to his timeline, apparently having learned nothing. Even Barry too, who only had his power for one day, went through more character growth than the Barry that's been a superhero for years. And so returning to the future, Barry shows up at Henry's trial, where his lawyer reveals a new piece of footage, all thanks to Barry's strategic camera adjustment in the past. This effectively establishes Henry's alibi and declares his innocence in the eyes of the court, leading to his release. But it also undermines the message of the film. Even after effectively destroying that timeline, killing his alternate self, Michael Keaton's Batman, who, remember, had finally solved crime in Gotham, Supergirl, and everyone else from that universe, including his mother and father, Barry still thought he could have his cake and eat it. Of course, when he looks up to see Bruce pulling into the courthouse, he's greeted not by the Ben Affleck Bruce he's familiar with, but George Clooney's Batman, indicating he messed up yet another alternate reality. Finally, we end with a post credit scene where Barry regales a bemused Arthur Curry with tales of his multiverse exploits. Of course, none of this means anything. So the writers literally have Barry learn nothing in order to facilitate a George Clooney and Aquaman appearance that lead nowhere. Oh my god! Flash! Hi. I love you! Thank you. Crashing you into Mr. Wayne. No, please don't. Yeah, Michael Keaton returns as Batman, something the promotional materials were eager to underline. Still, his dialogue and demeanor bear no distinctive marks of the 1989 Batman. He's a husk of his former self, but shouldn't really be considering he'd cleaned up Gotham. Other characters, while not as overtly mishandled as Batman, still fall short. Supergirl has a somewhat intriguing backstory and a hint of a more jaded, cynical superhero. However, the film fails to delve into this, reducing her to a prop for action sequences for most of her screen time. The same can be said for the antagonist, General Sod, who merely exists as a generic CGI beast for the visual effects team and the characters to grapple with. It all contributes to an impression of the Flash as akin to shaking a box of action figures randomly. Dark Flash is the catalyst for the major events, not Zod, but for some reason is then largely absent until the climax, with little build-up or suspense. This is largely because the movie is too preoccupied with waving the Michael Keaton as Batman flag. The one potential bright spot in the character lineup might have been Barry's alternate timeline version. He shares as much screen time as our original Barry, and provides an interesting contrast as a more naive, enthusiastic foil to the world-weary and experienced Barry we're familiar with. However, he quickly becomes unbearable as the enthusiastic novice trope is played up to a tiresome degree. Glimpses of genuine character are too few and far between to make this version of Barry someone we can genuinely root for. Unfortunately, the staleness of the plot and the lackluster characters leave the audience seeking solace in the film's visuals, which also disappoint. Whoever was responsible for the costume designs surely missed the mark. Flash's rubber suit makes him appear almost naked, and his head resembles a shiny Christmas ornament. That suit's a little revealing, isn't it? It allows for maximum mobility. Feels like I'm wearing nothing at all. Quit it! Quit it! Worse yet, as I keep saying, the CGI effects are among the poorest in the DCEU canon, with the lightning from Flash's super speed appearing to be lifted from a low-budget fan film. The physics applied in various sequences are entirely askew, leading to a rubbery, bony ambience instead of the grounded, gritty texture seen in films like Man of Steel. I was even shocked to learn that during an interview with Screen Rant, the film's supervising sound editor, Nancy Nugent, revealed some details about where some of its audio was sourced from, saying, I'll tell you the truth, a lot of them were pulled from YouTube, she said about the cameos. We were finding those old clips and then it was a matter of removing music if there was music tied to it, or just cleaning it up. So the massive multiverse scenes are composed of clips sourced from YouTube. Well done, Warner Brothers. Even the action choreography stumbles, with characters moving in a stiff, unnatural manner that's only exacerbated by the slow motion sequences designed to show off Flash's super speed. Batman's action sequences were great, but with Keaton in his 70s and a clear difference in how the actor moves and how Batman fought, it's clear this was just amazing stunt work. Some facets, like focusing on Barry's social solitude and his nostalgic compulsion to alter the past, fit in naturally in a Flash storyline, but this Barry doesn't learn the lessons that Flash does in the comics. 
Other elements, like Michael Keaton's comeback and the influx of CGI cameos in the third act, seem like obligatory insertions enforced by the studio, who knew they had a mess on their hands, rather than tools to facilitate the film's overarching narrative and message. Time travel and multiverse done right can permit filmmakers to tackle compelling existential inquiries around fate, purpose, and the dangerous seduction of existential nihilism. However, here, the film ultimately gets so engrossed with its cameo characters and ties to past DC titles, which literally have nothing to do with the film, that it neglects to fully develop or explore its protagonist's journey. The film's cursory treatment of Barry's mother's death, a crucial part of the original Flashpoint comic that spurred its story, exemplifies just how scant attention the Flash pays to Barry Allen and his arc. He doesn't even bother going back a few minutes to figure out who killed his mom. It's not even an afterthought. But most importantly, in his own feature film, the main superhero doesn't learn anything. The Flash is supposed to discover that even if you can change the past, it doesn't mean you should. But that's not what happens here. He makes the same mistake over and over again. The film could have ended with Barry realizing he could alter the position of the camera for his father, but given the carnage these actions can cause, deciding to ultimately accept that some things cannot be changed. Then when he returns to the future, we could have his father getting released due to new evidence found by Bruce Wayne. This could be old camera footage from outside the store, or eyewitnesses in this store, like customers or workers at the cash register that recognized him. I say this because that way, Barry learns that although he cannot fix everything alone, some things are possible with a team. This is pretty much the message one of the drafts of the film was aiming for, or at least setting up, with Barry telling Barry 2, Supergirl, and Batman that they need to work together like the Justice League to defeat Zod. But by the 45th Rider, the payoff is lost for this, and everything else from the first act. This is because working as a team amounts to nothing here, and I have to reiterate that our hero learns nothing from the entire experience. The Flash isn't so much a movie about Barry Allen, but rather a jumble of various, unrelated crossover concepts. It's one giant member Barry that's projecting to lose DC hundreds of millions of dollars in what could be one of the biggest box office flops of all time. Remember Bionic Man? Remember Chewbacca again? Oh, I love to remember Chewbacca! Oh, remember. <laughs> Brought down by a lethal cocktail of directorial turmoil, a studio-mandated creative shift, issues arising from having 45 writers, a lead actor with a rap sheet longer than Suge Knight, soulless cameos, poor CGI, a main character that learns nothing, nostalgia bait, and a release clashing with a comic book movie that executes similar narrative elements and themes with greater proficiency. It's clear that Barry Allen may be the fastest man alive, but the Flash movie, like its embattled star, could never outrun their problems. No sequel for you. With all that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we explore The Flash. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. <laughs>